Um, I think this uh, change in the governance of CJRF as a board is something that we would like other philanthropies to really examine and shift to, because in the end, who makes decisions is deeply influential. Um, and we know that from the recent studies that have come out, that the very small amount of philanthropy, global philanthropy that goes to climate change is around 2%. And actually most of that goes to the global north. And most of that, around 80% goes to organizations led by men. And most of that goes to organizations, 90% according to one study, which is very reliable, over 90% goes to organizations led by white people. So there is an intensive need to educate, rethink, reimagine, and put in place different governance structures. And having an amazing board that is not comprised anymore of donors making the decisions in the end of the day is a fantastic leap forward. So I want to just say congratulations to Heather. That was a really Thank big you. announcement in terms of seismic shifts in shifting power. It may not be the billion dollar pledge that many of you look to, but as a nerdy lawyer, governance breakthroughs are really important, and this is one of them. So thank you, Heather, for all the work that's gone into that. Thank so you. I'd like now to turn, I'm, you know, timekeeping badly here, but this is just the start of the session. I'm going to turn it over to an amazing youth leader, uh, or elder youth, as we now call her, uh, which is Dominic Zuris, who, if you come up on stage, everyone can see you. And Dominique uh, set up the Youth Climate Lab. Uh, she can tell you about that herself. And has very, very uh, much been in charge of driving this year's work under the collaborative, which has been to support youth coming into and taking their rightful space uh, in, in this work. So over to you, Dominique, and you're going to chair the next session. So I'd like to invite the speakers of the next session to please come and take your seats. Thank you. OK, cool. And you can, in the meantime, introduce yourself. Thank you for that intro, Farhana. Um, I recently left Youth Climate Lab because, as she said, I am now elder youth, an elderly young person. Um, and so please, <laughs> uh, panelists, join me on stage here. I have the great privilege of, of hosting this session, um, which really is about you know, continuation of how can philanthropy evolve and really support just transition efforts. Feel free to sit anywhere. I'll call on you folks. So we've, we've brought together, a, I think, a pretty epic panel of, of various perspectives uh, to talk about what we need. What do we need to step up support for a just transition? So on stage here, and maybe you can wave. I'll just briefly introduce you. Um, and then we'll hear from them, short interventions from each speaker. Um, but we have here Dr. Samia Salim from the Sajida Foundation. Let me just do a little wave. We have Nicole Kempis from Climate Strategies South to South Just Transition Project. We have Samantha Smith from the Just Transition Center. Yeah. And Andrew Potts from the Climate Change Heritage Network. So really excited. And, and Chandra, uh, from the CEO of International For Forum for Environment, iForest. Thanks for joining us. Um, so we'll kick it off with Dr. Samia uh, to share some perspectives. What do we need to support for Just Transition? Hello. Can you hear? Hello. Can you hear me? Okay. Can you maybe speak a little closer to the mic? Hello. Hello. Okay. Right. Okay. Bring it really close to me. Okay. Right. Hello, everyone, um, and thanks so much for having me here today at this session. I'm really excited to be here. Um, so um, my name is Samia Salim. I uh, am the acting head of a climate change program at a local nonprofit organization called Sajida Foundation, which really embodies a philanthropic uh, value in the sense that they are actually part of um, the 51% shareholding of a private organization, Renata Pharmaceutical Limited. So just hearing earlier um, the talk of how philanthropy can really be, needs to be so much part of the just transition movement and the work we're doing on climate change. So from Sajida Foundation, um, the last two years, we have been working on climate 
mostly on climate adaptation and resilience, but within that, uh, some work that I'll be sharing here today on solutions, exactly what we need to do to step up um, on this just transition uh, uh, pathway. So Sajida Foundation uh, works across the country in 343 areas, and eight of those are ones we're working where highly climate vulnerable region, and within that, the area that we're focused on is on green skills development. And I want to just explain why um, that needs to be part of uh, the, the uh, overarching work on just transitions. So as industries, so I'm just speaking from very much on the ground level, community-driven perspective from Bangladesh, and it's just transition movement in Bangladesh is very active. You see the industries, you see the government uh, working closely with ILO and World Bank on uh, green economy, on you know moving to net zero carbon. So bringing that back to the community perspective, how how is that related? And the areas where I work, due to different climatic uh, uh, impacts, there is a lot of migration uh, and there is a lot of need for um, adaptation and for jobs, really. And for those jobs to be um, in line with the just transition movement, we need to step up on skills development. So what Sajida is doing is uh, specifically working on eight um, skills related by, defined by the ILO, uh, by the Tibet Technical Vocational Training Institute in Bangladesh, and giving that training to specifically to women and youth. So that as we drive towards a more greener economy, as we move to have this transition, they can be part of that workforce. The challenge I wanted to highlight is the fact that there is still a wide disconnect between what is happening at the ground level um, the kind of work we're doing and others are doing on skills development, on, on, on greener skills. Uh, just give you a few exa examples within um, energy, food sector, uh, tourism. Those are the three areas that we're mainly focused on. And we're also talking to industry, and there's still not that recognition on the value of these skills that needs to be part of a low-carbon economy. So there needs to be more conversations between the labor market between uh, the, the organizations that are you know, having to move towards a greener uh, uh, economy and towards this transition, as well as the people, the workforce, the employees who need to be part of this uh, new economy that we want to be part of. So those, that's really one of the biggest challenges that I wanted to highlight, that we need to have that conversation between these organizations at the national level as well as from the ground. Thank you. Thank you so much. Samantha, I wonder if you can follow that up and share some of your perspectives from the Just Transition Center. Yeah, sure. But uh, maybe I should just say I want to introduce you to my colleague from the Bangladeshi unions who's here, who's also working with the ILO and Green Jobs, and is facing some of the same challenges that you're describing about getting the employees to the table and about a sort of meaningful transition for people. So, hi everybody, my name's Sam Smith. I work for the International Trade Union Confederation. Uh, we're the global federation for most of the world's unions. We represent 200 million organized workers in 162 countries. And about six years ago, after the negotiation of the Paris Agreement and the International Labor Organization's uh, Just Guidelines, with some initial, uh, initial grant from Oak Foundation, uh, ITUC set up the Just Transition Center. So we do what it, what it says on the tin. So we help unions get good plans for just transition. And right now, our work is more or less equally divided between unions in the global north, but also increasingly unions in the south. Um, we work pretty much only with uh, unions in high emitting countries and high emitting sectors, so oil and gas, mining, manufacturing, transport, agriculture, uh, construction, right? So if it has a lot of emissions, then uh, we're probably working with the unions that organize it. Um, and that doesn't mean that there isn't important work going on with, other, with, with unions in other sectors, textiles and so on, services. It's just that we have to focus and we're focusing on jobs that are most at risk now. So, um, 
we were asked to say a little bit about what needs to be, uh, where, you know, where more resources might be needed. I think, first of all, if we're thinking about some good developments, we have a bunch of, of comrades from the Brazilian trade union movement here. I had a meeting including their oil and gas unions. And uh, it was a very good conversation. I think with the new government, the new government is going to have climate and just transition as one of its top three priorities and is already planning with the trade unions social dialogue with the employers to try to get uh, plans for the workforce, but also broader engagements with communities, which in Brazil would be Afro communities and indigenous communities. So it's an exciting moment, also in other Latin American countries, in Colombia, same thing with our comrades who are here, uh, to some extent in Chile, Argentina. And just to remember, as trade unions, we're organized internationally. We're an international movement. So we talk to each other, we learn from each other, um, and we work together in groups. I think other, other places um, around the world, other sectors that are important, you know, there's this massive transition, uh, maybe starting in South Africa, and Open Society found funding for the work both in Brazil and, and in South Africa. And that was critical funding because it came during COVID. So where things are in South Africa is there's this Just Energy Transition Partnership, but there are many issues for civil society and trade unions about how the investment deal was put together. So there's gonna be a lot of work to be done in its implementation to make sure that these investments go to things that are gonna help poor and working class people, which is the vast majority of people in South Africa. So for example, electric vehicles, great, but really for rich people in South Africa. Um, so there are many, you know, there are things that, that need to happen there where it would be good to have a dialogue with trade unions or if you're working with civil society organizations with them about what needs to happen next, also on transparency and accountability of this agreement. I think um, other things that are important, we just uh, finished phase one of an initiative on just transition and the oil and gas sector. So I'm based in Norway with the Norwegian trade unions, you can imagine, very oil dependent country. Um, but this year we passed a resolution at our Congress saying that we will, uh, we agree that some resources should be left in the ground for climate or environmental re reasons. And we accept our responsibility as trade unionists. We organize 50% of the Norwegian workforce um, that on climate change and we're sort of looking towards, towards this transition. Um, so with the Norwegian unions, with Industrial, which uh, is the federation for most of the world's energy sector and energy intensive unions, we've had a process with unions from most of the world's big oil and gas producing countries. We have, we have oil unions in Iraq and Iran, in Nigeria, um, in Brazil, obviously, Argentina, but we also had the United States, we had the Canadians and so on. And uh, we, we, had a, we had this process, and I'll just say two outcomes from it. First of all, our whole movement has been working on just transition. Our members understand this issue. So they understand that a change is here. Uh, they may not like it, but they know they have to relate to it, and we have to organize so that we have plans for just transition. And second, they want to know about jobs. So I guess that would be one of my takeaway messages. It would be about the importance uh, for us as one of the three, uh, the two social partners in Just Transition, importance of good jobs for people to go to. So thanks a lot. Great, thank you so much. <laughs> Wonderful. Oh, sorry, I'm not very good at uh, the mics, I forget. Um, Nicole, I wonder if you can get to you and if you can share about the South to South project. Hi everyone, um, I'm Nicole. It's really lovely to be here. I'm the Program and Development Officer at Climate Strategies South to South Just Transitions Program. So I'm going to talk a little bit about how philanthropy can step up to support um, the, the research side of the Just Transitions process. So I'll just start by saying a bit about Climate Strategies and what we do. So Climate Strategies is a not-for-profit working at the research policy interface as a bridging organization. That means we work to convene um, groups of our, our member researchers and also institutions around the world to work on cutting edge research on topics like the just transition. 
We place co-creation at the heart of what we do, which means including lots of different stakeholders and communities in the process of creating knowledge. And lastly, we work hard to translate our findings into um, impactful solutions that policymakers can lean on. So one of the projects that we're supporting is our South to South Just Transitions Initiative, and that's a project that's been ongoing since 2019 and works with nine different countries and research institutions in those nine countries, uh, which are Malawi, Kenya, Ghana, Colombia, Argentina, Laos, Vietnam, Bangladesh, and Indonesia. Okay, got all of them. Um, so what we do is twofold. One of the things we do is we work with those organizations to build capacity and increase understanding of the just transition in those countries. And the second thing we do is create a platform to enable South to South knowledge sharing on that subject. And there have been a lot of findings from that project which look at the opportunities and challenges of the just transition in the global South both in specific countries and more generally. But today I want to focus on three overarching problems that we've identified where the just transition could really use more support from philanthropies to really accelerate in these different countries. And hopefully by naming some of these problems, we can start to bring together some of the solutions. So the first one is getting the research in front of the right people. So there's more and more research coming out on the just transitions. It's becoming an increasingly popular topic, even in places where it wasn't particularly well known before. But the challenge is to actually get that research in front of decision makers and in front of policy makers who can really make an impact and make changes with that research. So um, where philanthropy can really step in is by supporting research projects and supporting researchers to have enough resources to actually go ahead and do that stakeholder engagement because it's a lot of extra work to translate the research into fact sheets, into events, into radio shows and into workshops that can actually have a big impact. So I'll give an example. Um, currently we're working with a research institution in Bangladesh and they are developing research and working with high level ministers on how to support the just transition in the ready-made garments industry, and that's actually something we worked with Dr. Salim on. And another example is from our teams in Malawi who are engaging with networks such as the Civil Society Network for Climate Change in Malawi to increase awareness of just transition in the country. And so by supporting those kind of efforts, we can really accelerate the just transition in different places where it may not be as well known. Uh, the second thing I'll mess, I'll discuss then is also this issue of data and not having enough clear data to help us plan the just transition. So it's quite difficult to say who will be impacted and how they'll be impacted if you don't have the sectoral data to back that up on the research side. And it's something we've run into every single research project that we've worked on on just transitions in the global south. So for example, in Kenya, we worked with our research partner to think about how we can plan a more circular and sustainable waste management system in Nairobi and how to transition to such a system. But we found that if, you know, the many informal workers such as the pickers, the sorters, the artisans who rely on that sector in Nairobi aren't considered in the transition, then thousands of jobs, maybe in, even tens of thousands of jobs indirectly could be at risk. But it's hard to say exactly how many people it will impact and how um, because it's, um, yeah, it's hard to get that, that kind of sectoral data. So investing in that is, is critical to planning and implementing the just transition. And then the last thing I'll say is that it's so important to invest in capacity building. So we've heard from um, various people about all the different stakeholders involved, but engaging stakeholders in a participatory process is very time consuming and it's very difficult to engage uh, people like, you know, like informal rubbish collectors, like union workers from the RMG sector in Bangladesh, like smallholder farmers in Malawi. So that takes time and it takes investment. So having philanthropy step into that is a really great way to accelerate the just transition. And if you'd like to hear more about that, Climate Strategies is hosting an event on Wednesday on making the financial case for just transitions and diverse economies. So thank you. Thank you so much. We'd now love to turn to Chandra Bhushan, uh, Tell us about your work at the International Forum for Environment and what do you think we need to do to step up support for Just Transition? Okay, hopefully it's working. So I'm 
Chandra. I work at iForest. It's a Delhi-based research and innovation organization. And uh, we have set up a center for just transition called India Just Transition Center. And the focus, so there's a few brochure I've got. You can take a copy for, for the center. Uh, our focus is research. And the first part of our work was to understand what just transition means for developing countries. Okay. Uh, the concept came from labor union, and thanks to a person like Samantha and ILO, who popularized the concept, probably at the right time in history, because uh, we were getting late uh, in terms of transition. I have always wondered why mitigation and adaptation took front step, whereas we never talked about people. And it was only in 2015 that we started talking about people. At the end of the day, the heart of climate transition is going to be people's transition. How do you make people move from current job to green job? And how do you define that green job? Because there can be a lot of green washing in defining green job. Okay. So as I said, our, our, our primary job was to understand what just transition mean and what it would entail. And we have been working for the last two years, uh, largely in coal areas of India, uh, which is the eastern part of India. Uh, it is also the most poor part of India. In fact, you can take the map of the world, uh, plot this extractive industry on top of it, you plot natural resources and put poverty, and you are likely to see the overlap. In fact, the richest part of the world have poorest people as far as resources is concerned. Now, and another reality of this area is that the economy is informal. Okay. So the formal economy are largely not in extractive part of the world, especially in Global South. So it took us two years to realize that we need to define just transition which will suit the realities of Global South. Uh, and frankly, I, I was hearing my colleague from Climate Strategies, uh, it requires hard work on the ground. You don't have data. For example, how many people will be impacted in India if coal mines close? It's a fundamental question everyone should ask. How many jobs will be lost in a country if you close down oil wells, uh, gas plant, and, 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 and coal, coal plants? And I can bet right now, you will have largely secondary research, which has no relevance to the ground reality. Okay. So just transition research, which a lot of people I see uh, information coming out, uh, are, we are just scratching the surface of understanding what just transition will mean. So my first recommendation to philanthropies is invest in knowledge. If you really want to get just transition done, invest in knowledge, especially in Global South, because knowledge is not there. There is a lot of knowledge in formal economy. You can tell right now that there are 60,000 people formally working in coal industry in the US. Pretty much these numbers are very much well documented. I don't know how many people are working in coal mines in India. A three district region, sub region that we have studied, we are finding as much as one third to two fifth of the entire household depend on some way or another on coal mines. So, First uh, recommendation, invest in knowledge. Second, invest in capacity building. That's going to be the uh, other part of uh, work. See, transition will happen, but the, I, I think the largest scale closure of fossil fuel-based industry will only happen after 2030. Okay. So the disruption in job market, you will see in next five to seven years. But this five to seven years, philanthropies to should invest, use this time to build the foundation of that disruption that is coming. Okay, that's what my recommendation will be. Thank you. Amazing, thank you so much. Andrew, tell us about the Climate Change Heritage Network and how you fit into this conversation. Yeah, th thank you, Dominique. So my name is Andrew Potts and I'm the coordinator of the Climate Heritage Network. We're a network of arts, culture and heritage networks working to unlock the power of culture from arts to heritage to help people imagine and realize low carbon, just climate resilient futures. 
Our members tend to be libraries, archives, museums, archaeology sites, performing arts groups, craft and creative industries, uh, site managers. And I really appreciate uh, the uh, Collaborative and Farhana for giving me the chance to introduce you to possibly the most important dimension of Just Transition that you haven't heard about yet, the social and cultural dimension. We, we know that Just Transition will be disruptive and painful, and so how do we make it more just? There is no topic where culture, arts, heritage can have a bigger impact, in my opinion, than this one. For starters, we're not going to have a Just Transition by demonizing the families whose breadwinners and ancestors built the carbon economy and work in it today. And so in culture and heritage, we're working to document, valorize, memorialize, celebrate the historic contribution of those workers and families as we transition them to a green economy. We use culture and heritage and reskilling from craft and creative industries to tourism. And so these are just a few of the ways that the culture sector is contributing to just transition. But I want to just spend 30 seconds on this topic of tourism. Increasingly, greenhouse gas intensive forms of tourism, including cultural tourism, are at the heart of economic development strategies in the global south. What is the impact on these communities of carbon taxes and efforts to decarbonize aviation and tourism? Dominique and Farhana and I traveled by camel into the St. Catherine Mountains yesterday in the shadow of the St. Catherine's Monastery World Heritage Site, and we heard these concerns loud and clear from Bedouin leaders. So how do we have a just transition for greenhouse gas intensive uh, tourism dependent communities, making it fair for the global south while we look at over-visited global north destinations? So you can uh, find out more about this on the webpage of the Climate Heritage Network on a tab called Just Transition and Culture. And very lastly, let me say to the funders in the room that the cultural dimensions of climate action in general and the contributions of arts, culture, and heritage in particular are not well recognized by the funding community. I ask you to look at the work of Bomiast in Western Poland that is using media, art, film, um, music, heritage to support a just transition by Silesian coal miners. I ask you to look at the Community Wetlands Forum in Ireland. It's using poetry, literature, heritage for a just transition for communities dependent on peat cutting, bog cutting. So we need the donor community to support the cultural dimensions of just transition, especially for institutions based in the Global South and South-South collaboration, but also for Global North institutions that are so trying to support these actions worldwide. Thank you. Thank you. Wow, I wish we could stay here forever and talk about this. Um, but shortly, the next panel will join us on stage. Um, and just as we close off, and taking a, a page from your book, Andrew, where you specifically mentioned a website that these people should, should, should check it out. So I wonder if we'll just do the last round and you can just share the sort of one link that you think these folks uh, should, should, should check out. Do you want to start off with resharing? I cheated and went already, but uh, cl climateheritage.org, click on the COP27, culture at COP27 tab, and under that you'll find just transition and culture statement. Um, yeah, similarly for us at Climate Strategies, if you go to the Climate Strategies page, you can find our COP27 page with our events. If you click on that, you can see everything we're doing on just transitions, and also there you can see our reports from our South to South just transitions work on opportunities and challenges. So uh, our, webs our, our website isn't that great, but uh, if you'd like to know more about what we're doing, you can email me, samantha.smith at justtransitioncentercentre.org. And if you want to see our webpage, again, advance warning, not great, ITUC, go to ituccsi.org and look for the Just Transition Center logo. It looks kind of like a Christmas tree ornament, red and green. I want to echo with Samantha our, our website, which is sajidafoundation.org. Um, it's, it's great. It has all the programs. Unfortunately, because the climate change program is quite new, it doesn't have too much details on this work. So I would just be um, happy to uh, receive emails, which is drsamia at sajida.org. Um, that has a lot of our work, um, as well as our work with uh, climate strategies on how we're working with the organizations, with, with uh, the different sectors on, on this um, just transition program. 
ijtc.org.in and you will get all the material. We have a side event on Friday with ILO on informal economy and informal workup. Invite you to join. Great. Join me in thanking this amazing panel.